Abomination Bolts Chapter 5 Into the Training Grounds Content Warning While Abomination Bolts contains typical Pathfinder action and adventure, it also presents themes of suicide, ableism, body horror, and human experimentation. Before you begin, understand that player consent, including that of the Game Master, is vital to a safe and fun play experience for everyone. You should talk with your players before beginning and modify descriptions or scenarios as appropriate. While the upper levels of Belcora's massive dungeon were primarily for her personal use, she designed the middle levels for work. Belcora trawled the Darklands for dangerous predators and bloodthirsty aberrations, but their feral power wasn't enough for her. She needed to mold them into an army to assault the metropolis of Absalom. In the middle levels, she had these forces forged for battle, in body and mind. The fifth level thus included a massive arena and training grounds where gladiators would fight for the right to lead her monstrous troops. In the Darklands, Belcora encountered worm-like aberrations called Sugathus, who had a curious eagerness to serve her. She then repurposed the sixth level, formerly support rooms for her monsters and their trainers, as well as a preserve where she kept large beasts, as laboratories. There, the Sagathus sought to perfect flesh warping to create flawless monsters under the guidance of their leader, Jafaki. Belcora constructed the smaller seventh level as a prison. She didn't intend to keep many captives, since creatures who displeased her could serve as raw flesh for Jafaki's experiments or as food for her monsters. However, one of Belcora's chief administrators, the contract devil Uravain, insisted on building the prison. Before long, the level became a warped mirror of hell. A decade into building her dungeon and honing her preparations, Belcora died at the hands of the heroic Roseguard who had no idea about these subterranean machinations. The abomination bolts fell into disarray almost immediately. Uravain attempted to assert control, but Jafaki's aberrant creations fought the devil's forces to a standstill. A sort of stalemate settled over the middle levels, and the borders of control have shifted only slightly over the centuries. Jafaki merely wanted peace to continue their experiments, Uravain idly prepared for the surface invasion, as his contract required of him. Even though he knew it was almost impossible for him to complete his contract because Belcora had died, word of the Sugathus skilled flesh warping spread. Before long, arrogant or desperate creatures came to the abomination bolts, seeking remarkable transformations, though few ultimately considered their changes to be improvements. The people of Atari have no idea that this traffic exists, because it comes from the Darklands far below the dungeon's middle levels. When Belcora returned as a ghost only a few years ago, the abomination bolts hummed with power of her return. The significance of this event was lost on the research-focused Jafaki, but not on Uravain. The devil realized he could now finally fulfill his contract with the sorcerer, Yet, Uravain had already spent centuries contemplating a well-drafted loophole that would allow him to simply return to Hell without providing her any aid at all. To do so, Uravain needs a specific mortal soul, that of Vol Rajani, one of the Rose Guard. Vol is long dead, of course, but the clause can still apply if Uravain receives the soul of Vol's last descendant, Carmen Rajani. Uravain couldn't collect the soul while Belcora was merely dead, but now that she has returned, Uravain is willing to abandon his extensive preparations if someone can get Carmen's soul for him, and he selects the dungeon delvers from Atari to handle this matter on his behalf. The Spectral Seal A spectral barrier blocks the only passage from the fourth level of the Abomination Vaults to the fifth, as the heroes learn from the ghost of Atari Ilvashti in Area D-18, 
only icons of all four members of the Rose Guard can pierce it. Retrieving the icons. It shouldn't take the heroes too much asking around in town to find out about the Rose Guard icons. The Rose Guard founded Atari and consisted of the rogue Otari Ilvashti, the cleric Asfina Menhims, the wizard Zamavdian, and the fighter Volrajani. The best place to learn about the Rose Guard is the Menhims Manor, the residence of the town's mayor and his family, all descendants of Asfina Menhims. The mayor's eastern wing contains a public museum of the town's history, although this museum contains replicas of the Rose Guard's adventuring gear and even a few common items that the adventurers once owned. The specific icons of Atari Ilvashti's ghost described to the heroes aren't here. Mayor Osef Menhims, Vandy Banderdash at the Dawnflower Library, or Rin Savinzi at Rin's Wonders, can point the heroes in the right direction. The items are described in the Adventure Toolbox. Asfina Menhim's Hunter's Brooch is in a locked shadow box in the music room of the Menhim's Manor. If the heroes honestly and openly tell Osef Menhim's why they need it, he permits them to borrow the brooch for as long as they like. For being honest with him, they automatically earn the Menhim's support, as described previously which allows heroes to earn income by tutoring the Menhims' children, and more immediately pertinent, lets them meet Doriana Menhims and aid with her malady as described in the future. If the heroes previously earned the Menhims' support, Osef lets them keep the brooch in exchange for all they've done for him and the town. The bookseller, Morlebent, keeps the Mavdian's threshold of truth in his academic collection at Odd Stories. If Odd Stories already supports the heroes, Morlebent gladly allows them to borrow the book. If not, they must promise Morlebent that they'll take special care of the spellbook before he loans it to them. Convincing Morlebent might require extensive promises, a demonstration on the proper care of ancient tomes, or both. Either way, Morlebent wants to get a full account of what they do with it, and any related magical phenomena. Vol Rajani's longsword, the Cooperative Blade, is normally on display at the entrance to the Dawnflower Library, but it was stolen the previous night. Carmen's Background Carmen grew up on the stories of Vol's bravery, dedication, and skill. As a boy, Carmen didn't understand why his family's sword was hanging in the Dawnflower Library and not in their house. It was theirs, or so his parents insisted. As Carmen grew older, he first worked at Atari's blacksmith shop, Blade for Glades, and later won the shop in a lucky wager against the prior owner, yet he couldn't forget his family sword. Officially, the Menhims family claimed ownership over Vol's ancient blade, but allowed it to stay at the library as an act of purported generosity that Carmen found offensive. The summer his parents were waylaid and slain by bandits on the road from Absalom, Carmen became a broken man. His work at the smithy became erratic, and he stopped relaxing with his friends and helping his community. With no other direction, Carmen squandered his inheritance, spending the money on entertainment, fine clothes, and rare whiskey. He started spending more time gambling and drinking at the crook's nook than he did at his smithy. Eventually, the inheritance money ran out, and Carmen was faced with a sizable debt. Several owed favours later, he started grifting travellers or hustling them at knife-throwing boards at the Crook Snook, but his vices still outpaced his earnings from petty cons, and soon he took to outright thievery under Yasmira's tutelage, the Ace of Blades as the Mokaneer given to the best knife-thrower at the Crook Snook, and Carmen Rajani has held that title for so long it has become his nickname among fellow members of the Osprey Club. Within a few years, Carmen had settled into his new life, working as a smithy during the day, carousing at the Cook's Nook at night, and occasionally engaging in some petty larceny while his coin purse started to get light. When he heard rumours that people thought he was wasting his life though, it stung his pride. He resolved to run for mayor against Osef, to show the whole town that his family was equal to that of the Menhims family. Everyone thought Carmen's candidacy was a joke, 
The second time he ran, his platform became nothing more than sharp personal attacks against the Menhim's family. The townspeople felt the joke had gone sour and considered it a waste of their time. He met their jibes with violence, getting into brawls to prove that he was a better man. The third time he ran for office, he actually put in effort to help the community. Though he lost by much smaller a margin, he took the loss as proof that kindness can't get you any further than your fists can. The fourth time he tried to force a successful campaign with open bribes and backmail. Osef won by a landslide showing up on election day wearing the cooperative blade as part of his celebratory regalia. Carmen finally decided the magic sword must be the key to his success. Everyone in town knew it brought Atari good luck, so whoever held the sword had the town in their pocket. As Vol's heir, he deserved the sword. He begged Osef to sell the weapon, but Osef suspected it was some new scheme or worse, connected to one of Carmen's rumored crimes or debts, and countered with delays, excuses, and price increases. Finally, Carmen decided he had enough. If he wanted the family's sword back, he'd have to take it. The Theft While the heroes were off in the abomination vaults, Carmen crept into the Dornfower library and started a small fire in the book restoration room. While the fire distracted the staff, he broke the cooperative blade display case and fled with the sword. After an hour, the staff had put out the fire without any serious injuries and only a few lost books. A miracle the acolytes attribute to Serenray's protection. By the time anyone discovers the theft, Carmen was already on his way to a local cave called Smuggler's Refuge. It didn't take long for the town guard to realize the missing Carmen Rajani was the prime suspect. He had pestered the mayor about the sword for years after all. A few witnesses saw someone matching his description absconding from the library clutching a cloak over some long object. Vandy Banderdash, head priestess of the Dawnflower Library, meets with the heroes when they come to ask her about the sword. She can barely contain her rage, although she seems more angry about the theft than the fire. She asks them to find Carmen and bring him back alive to face trial and receive an appropriate punishment. Finding Carmen shouldn't be too hard, as he acted hastily and didn't have time to cover his tracks or prepare a good cover story. The Atari garrison can't provide much help. Captain Longsaddle points out that since Carmen isn't in town or along the roads, the guards don't have jurisdiction to pursue him. He harumphs and adds, Good riddance to that troublemaker! He'll keep running if he knows what's good for him. He doesn't provide any aid to capture Carmen, but happily takes him into custody if the heroes bring the smith into town. Blades for Glades The heroes find Carmen's blacksmith shop, Blades for Glades, closed. They won't find any clues here. If the heroes already had support of Blades for Glades, they recall that Carmen mentioned Smuggler's Refuge in the past, so it is a likely hideout. Combing the Town if the heroes ask about Carmen's location in Atari, nearly everyone suggests they go talk to Crook's Nook, a hero who succeeds on a DC-20 diplomacy check to gather information. He is about the smuggler's refuge from townsfolk and recalls that Carmen spent time there in his youth, as did many people in Atari. Crook's Nook Asking around the Crook's Nook brings the owner, Yin Yasmira, over to talk. She brazenly asks for 10 gold pieces, a special fee for food and drinks. Heroes who pay up, or succeed at a DC-20 diplomacy check to request information, get her to open up about Carmen. The blacksmith has been a little too bold to remain in her good graces, and this theft was the last straw. She mentions that Carmen has likely gone into hiding at the smuggler's refuge outside of town. If Yin Yasmira has a favourable opinion of the heroes from their previous actions, she gives this information for free. Smuggler's Refuge, a low level 5 encounter. This cave is only about an hour outside of town, just a short walk through the forest, north of an abandoned fish camp. Although it's too far inland for transporting heavy cargo, this cave once saw a lot of use from smugglers moving lighter goods. They hid their loot in one of the cave's many niches, planning to come back for a later time, or use the site as a drop point for transactions with the buyer. Today, with the recent decline in smuggling, 
Atari's young people come to the camp when they need a break from the lumber town. The map of the smuggler's refuge appears here. Rotted crates, forgotten clothes and other debris suggest this cave is occasionally used but rarely cleaned. A cold campfire surrounded by logs sits at the cave's center. Faint smells of mildew and smoke hang in the still air. Like many visitors before him, Carmen initially built a fire here but put it out when he realized this isn't a good place for smoke to vent. A few old cots, heaps of discarded clothes and empty crates show that this cave occasionally is inhabited. Carmen uses the best of the cots and the freshest clothes for bedding. The east wall of the cave contains an exceptionally well hidden secret door that leads to the fifth level of the abomination vaults. A hero searching this area must succeed on a DC-28 perception check to find it. Even if discovered, however, the secret door doesn't open from this side. The door's mechanism causes the heavy stone wall to swing inward, and it can't do so because of a cave-in on the other side of it. The heroes might clear this entrance from the other side later, in area E7. Creature If Carmen isn't aware of the heroes, he sits on his cot, chewing some dried fish and turning the cooperative blade over and over in his hand while he thinks. He wonders whether to return the sword and hopes for nothing more than a stiff fine or flee to his ancestral homeland of Nidal. If Carmen knows of the hero's presence, he hides behind the crate and uses stealth for initiative. Carmen knows the heroes by reputation. He assumes they've come here to take him prisoner and he puts up a fight. While defending himself, he shouts to them, You'll never take me alive! And, This is my sword! I took what's rightfully mine! He surrenders if the heroes plainly don't reciprocate his aggression, or when he's reduced to fewer than 30 hit points. Talking with Carmen If Carmen has a chance to explain himself before the heroes take him into custody, he tries to justify stealing the sword. I tell you, it's mine! The sword is mine! How can I steal something that already belongs to me? It belonged to Vol Rajani. I'm her only surviving descendant. That uptight bear says the sword belongs to his family. Just because a pack of kobolds had their hands on it for a while, and his ancestors snatched it from them. He says an heirloom is an heirloom, and he's right, but it's my heirloom. Look, I tried to buy it off him, but every time I saved enough coin, he raised the price. 50 gold, then 100, then 200. Then he said it wasn't for sale. I had no choice but to take it. It belongs to Vol, to the Rajani family. It belongs to me. Carmen pleads for the heroes to let him go and steadfastly claims his right to take the sword. He answers their questions as best he can. Likely inquiries to responses follow. Why is the sword so important to you? It belonged to my family, to Vol. She was the best of the Rose Guard and the best of the Rajanis, and I wanted to be mayor. I've tried four times, but I always lost to Osif. If I had the sword, well, people say it gives the town good luck. If I had it, they'd want me to be mayor, so that I could give them luck. Why do you want to be mayor? To be in charge. There's no reason a Menheim should always run this place. Osif says it's because his family is a descendant from heroes. Well, so am I. So I can do a much better job than that old bastard. Why did you set fire to the library? The fire was just a distraction. I didn't want to hurt anyone. And they should have put it out sooner. It's not like I burned anything other than some paper. Even if the sword is rightfully yours, you committed arson. Don't you think you deserve to go to jail? Arson? Ha! <laughs> Vandalism, maybe. I'll pay the fine for starting a fire, but the sword's mine. Why should we let you go? Because I'll pay you. Fifty gold, a uh, hundred even. Take it all, but I get to keep my sword. How did you get that much gold? Saved it? Borrowed some? O okay, borrowed most of it. Look, I just had to get that sword. If we let you go, what will you do? I don't know. Stay here a while, maybe, and think it out. I guess I can't really go back to town now. Maybe I'll head to Nadal. They say Vol was from there. Some say she was royalty, and maybe I can get the life that's due to me. 
If we let you go, can we borrow the sword first? As long as you're not taking it or me back to town, I'll go with you to do whatever you need to do. Carmen's fate. The heroes decide what to do with Carmen. He is likely to go along with any of the hero's demands, particularly if they have proved that they can beat him in a fight. Let him go. Even if the heroes are willing to let him go, they still need the cooperative blade to breach the barrier in the abomination vaults. Carmen goes with them for this task since he doesn't want to let the sword out of his sight, but he doesn't fight in the abomination vaults if the heroes get into trouble. After the barrier goes down, Carmen retreats to the cave to consider what he'll do, and likely stays there for a few days. Turn him in. If the heroes turn him over to the Atari garrison, Captain Longsaddle tosses him into a cell and jokes about throwing away the key. Longsaddle lets the mayor know that the heroes have the cooperative blade. The mayor is fine with the heroes borrowing it, as long as it ends up back with the town. Longsaddle takes Carmen's money as a pool to repay any costs from his crimes, but lets the heroes keep Carmen's other equipment. Kill him. If the heroes kill Carmen in combat, people in the town understand that it's a risk when apprehending a criminal. Osif arranges for Carmen's burial in the Atari Cemetery and lets the heroes borrow the cooperative blade. Treasure. Apart from what Carmen carries on him, his adventurer's pack near the fire contains a week of improvised rations and two water skins. A hero who succeeds on a DC-20 perception check while searching the cave finds a long forgotten bottle of old law whiskey hidden in a pebble covered niche. The aged alcohol is worth three gold pieces. Experience Award. Award the heroes 30 experience for capturing Carmen alive, in addition to the experience for defeating him. Doriana's Dreams. Although the heroes can find plenty of adventure in the Abomination Vaults, other mysterious events are afoot in Atari. The most significant of these occurrences centre around the mayor's eldest daughter, the teenage Doriana Menhems. Doriana is on the cusp of developing psychic powers. While no one on the surface is aware of this, a denizen of Leng named Yason Kalir, in Area G18, has become aware of her power. With the barrier to the lower levels down, he can twist her dreams into nightmares and take the role of her saviour. He intensifies this long plan over weeks of nighttime adventures, with her in the dimension of dreams. Yason Kalir intends to eventually thrust Doriana physically into the dimension of dreams to augment other denizens' plots. Two nights after the heroes open the seal to the Abomination Vault's lower level, Doriana Menhems begins to have horrifying nightmares. She awakens several times each night, screaming and clutching a stuffed griffin she hasn't touched in years. When asked, she doesn't recall the specifics of these nightmares beyond her fear and the appearance of a man shrouded in mismatched fabric who comforts her. If the heroes have earned the support of the Menhems Manor, they've met Doriana, and they hear about her nightmares from the other children Otherwise, the mayor seeks out whichever hero is best known as a healer or as an authority on occultism. He mentions his daughter's nightmares and the motley man who acts as a protector and saviour within them. He asks them to discreetly look into the matter and help with his daughter. Asking Rin Mayor Menhems views Rin Savinzi of Rin's Wonders as an unreliable eccentric so he doesn't think to involve her in his family's troubles. However, she's an expert in occultism. She gladly accompanies the heroes to help Doriana if they ask, so long as she doesn't need to meet with the beleaguered girl indoors. If the party lacks someone with occultism training to get to the bottom of these mysteries, Rin's involvement is a possible solution. Examining Doriana Even the first time the heroes examine Doriana, she already appears gaunt and pale as if she's caught a severe malady. A character who succeeds at a DC-15 medicine check verifies that she's nevertheless in good physical health. The heroes initially find no evidence of any magic or curse upon her. A search of Doriana's room discovers that several of her childhood toys have been brought back out for her to play with. Doriana states vaguely that she misses them 
and that she wants to play with them again. Doriana's nightmares are tenacious. Any magic the heroes use to help Doriana get a good night's sleep fail unless the caster succeeds at a secret DC-27 counteract check. Experience Award Award the heroes 30 experience for taking care and time to help Doriana, even if they can't figure out what's wrong just yet. Doriana's Decline Doriana's condition worsens over time. Her nightmares lessen in intensity, but she feels exhausted and anxious during the day. She begins to talk with the motley man as an imaginary friend even when awake, eschewing activities with anyone else. Her disposition becomes erratic and childish, and she often scratches absently at her right hand. Her sibling doesn't want anything to do with her, and even her parents find her hard to put up with. She has been afflicted by Yasun Kalir's outcast curse spell, which the heroes might detect or remove normally. If they do so, Yasun Kalir casts it on her again the following night. With a successful DC-26 diplomacy check, the heroes gain Doriana's trust and get her to open up to them. If they have the support of the Menhim's Manor, they also have a plus four circumstance bonus to this check. Only one hero can attempt this check each day. On a critical failure, they must instead wait 1d4 days. On a success, Doriana insists that the Motley Man is real and discusses one of the following two subjects with them. On a subsequent day's success or on initial critical success, she reveals both. Gifts. The Motley Man gives her gifts in the form of her old childhood toys, and the best of them is a stuffed griffin. Even a cursory examination reveals that something hard is sewn into the stuffed toy. A character who opens it up finds a large flawless ruby worth 30 gold pieces. Even if the heroes take this ruby, the next time Doriana dreams, it reappears inside another childhood toy from wherever it is. It is key to Doriana and doesn't leave her for long. Wrist Writing Doriana absently points out several bruises on her right wrist that she can't remember getting. A hero trained in occultism who views the bruises can attempt a DC-22 occultism check to decipher writing. A hero who speaks Alka gains a plus two circumstance bonus to this check. On a success, a hero notes that the words are related to some dream traveling rituals. On a critical success, the heroes note the word Leng among the bruises. Either of these clues point to the involvement of a malevolent extraplanar creature called the Denizen of Leng. Leng is a terrifying extraplanar location just past the dimension of dreams, where cruel and sinister people called Denizens of Leng live. A hero who succeeds on a DC-24 occultism check realizes the nature of the creature plaguing Doriana. If the heroes obtain both clues, then any hero trained in occultism realizes this without a check. Though the heroes might identify the source of Doriana's trouble, there's not much they can do for her yet, because Yason Kalir doesn't ever physically get anywhere near her. Experience Award Award the heroes 80 experience if they discover the denizen of Leng is involved in Doriana's malady. Doriana's Madness About the time the heroes finish their exploration of the laboratory's level and start to investigate the prison level, Doriana's condition suddenly gets worse. She sleepwalks most of the time and is unaware of the events around her, as though seeing the world in a hazy dream. Her right hand withers for no discernible reason. Mayor Menhims takes his daughter to Vandy Banderdash at the Dawnflower Library, but the clerics can't aid her. The heroes hear about all of this on their next return to Atari. Everyone else in the Menhims family is beside themselves with grief. If the heroes haven't previously gained Doriana's trust, they can now attempt to do so, but the DC for the diplomacy check is 27 and they gain no bonuses for having the support of the Menhim's Manor. Doriana is beyond caring about her former friends. If the heroes have Doriana's trust, she describes great adventures with the Motley Man in a fantastical land of forests, palaces, and snowfields. The Motley Man told her that they would soon be together, 
on their adventures forever, but he wanted her right hand as a token. Doriana didn't hesitate to offer it to him, and when she awoke her hand was withered. She doesn't consider it particularly serious a loss, since her best friend wanted it so much. Doriana doesn't know how long it will be until she and the Motley Man are together forever. And this timetable is intentionally left vague, so you can prompt your players to action without punishing them if they fail to reach Yasond Kalir quickly. They should have at minimum a week before Doriana vanishes. Doriana's connection with Yasond Kalir is now so strong that the heroes can discover him through this link. A hero trained in occultism realizes that they can learn more by examining Doriana's psychic patterns while she is dreaming. This is an exploration activity that takes 8 hours and requires a DC 23 occultism check. With a successful check, the hero learns the first facts they don't already know. With a critical success, they learn two facts, and with a critical failure, they learn a false fact of your invention. There is a strong link between Doriana's mind and the dimension of dreams. A denizen of Leng has strengthened this conduit. Unless that creature is destroyed, Doriana will eventually be drawn wholly into that dimension and lost to this world. The hero gains images of the denizen's lair. A stone chamber with a very old map of the inner sea region painted across it from a map consisting of several tattered pieces of paper that together constitute a detailed map of Atari. The hero knows the denizen's name is Yason Kalir and gains an accurate mental image of him. The hero can use the ruby in Doriana's possession to track Yason Kalir and can use the following activity with the ruby, even though Doriana doesn't care if they take it. It's still attuned to her and returns to her each night. The heroes must therefore return to Atari to recover it each day. Activation, 10 minutes, in vision. Frequency, once per day. Effect, you focus on the ruby, which casts a fifth level locate spell that only targets Yason Kalir. Treasure, after the heroes defeat Yason Kalir, the ruby no longer returns to Doriana and becomes an unusually shaped wand of locate. Doriana swiftly recovers afterwards. Mayor Osef effusively thanks the heroes and arranges for each of them to receive an item of 7th level or lower for their choice from Absalom at his expense. These items take a week to arrive. Experience Award Award the heroes 120 experience points for freeing Doriana from Yasonkali's clutches. Chapter 5 Synopsis The chapter begins with the heroes seeking the final icons needed to enter the Abomination Vault's middle levels, but a recent theft complicates this task. The heroes confront the thief, Carmen Rajani, in a remote cave where they must decide what to do with him, a choice they don't yet realize will have a meaningful repercussion later. They can then explore the fifth level of the Abomination Vaults, which contains masterless horrors and malevolent spirits, and address a mystery regarding the mayor's daughter. Environmental cues in the smuggler's cave, dripping water, mineral tang in the air, broken crates, moldy bedding, old campfires. Environmental cues in the arena level, dust with strange tracks in it, gouges along the walls, broken links of chains, splintered furniture, unidentifiable bones, rusted scraps of metal, bits of broken claw or carapace. Chapter 5 Treasure The permanent and consumable items available as treasure in Chapter 5 are as follows. A plus one striking composite short bow, a plus one studded leather armor, a plus one Tamchal Chakaram, a Bloodseeker beak, bottled air, climbing bolt, the Cooperative Blade, Dragon Turtle Scale, Ever-Burning Torch, Greater Hat of Disguise, Hunter's Brooch, Lesser Sea Touch Elixir, Moderate Beast Oil Mutagen, Moderate Juggernaut Mutagen, Moderate Quicksilver Mutagen, Moderate Tanglefoot Bag, Ring of Wizardry Type 1, Staff of Abjuration, Wand of Heal 2nd Level, Wand of Locate, 
Wand of Summon Animal 2nd Level Arena Features Once the heroes recover all four of the icons and place them on the altar in the upper temple of Nimbraloth in area D13, they are able to enter the 5th level of the Abomination Bolts. Belcora used this level to test the resolve of her minions and her prisoners and hope to someday establish a premier facility for gladiators, from which she would take the best combatants for her forces. Presently, Jafaki and other Sugathas use this level as a dumping ground for their failed experiments. The ceilings on this level are 15 feet tall unless otherwise indicated. Areas not described as having light are completely dark. The doors are made of wood banded with iron, and virtually all of them bear gouges or scarring from violent beasts smashing their way through in the past. The doors are weighted to swing closed after a few moments if they aren't propped open. Area E1 Upper Shaft A Moderate 5 Encounter A crumbling staircase leads to a cracked and badly stained mosaic tile floor. To the south, a walkway encircles a round, gaping pit leading to a spiral stairway that clings to the edge of the pit. A twisted iron banister follows the edge of the walkway and stairs. The acrid smell of chemicals and rot, with just a tinge of sulphur, wafts from the pit's darkness. Strange moaning echoes up the shaft. The circular pit is 80 feet deep and ringed with a spiral staircase. The laboratory's level is 40 feet below in area F1, and the prison level is at the bottom in area G1. Creatures The Sagathus deposited some rejected experiments here to keep them out of the way. Two Grothluts lurk around the bends, just out of sight of the stairs, and a gibbering mouther sprawls on the walkway near the door leading east. They attack as soon as they detect any creatures in the area, moaning and gibbering as they do. The Grothluts are immune to the mouther's gibbering, but the Mouther isn't immune to the Grothlut's piteous moan. These creatures fight until destroyed, but they don't bother pursuing anyone who retreats up the stairs. Area E2 Large Monster Holding A Moderate 5 Encounter Rusted iron chains hang from the ceiling of this room, each ending in an oversized manacle. The octagonal eastern end of the room contains a circular pit covered by a rusted iron grate Torn bolts and scrap metal dangle from the ceiling above the pit. Piles of scrap fill the four alcoves that open off to the wide hall that constitutes the room's west end. A Velstrak named Cratonis once prepared large monsters for fighting in the arena in this part of the dungeon. She kept them in the cells in Area E3, where she tortured them to enhance their aggressiveness and scarred them to augment their ferocious appearance using the now rusted contraptions in the alcove. When it came time for the creatures to fight, she lowered them into the chamber below in area F2, using a heavy winch in the ceiling which is now inoperable and unstable. The heroes might have met another Evangelist Velstract named Volgrist on the level above this one. Gratonis and Volgrist were once as close as sisters, but each has fallen to her own independent malaise. Hazard, the rusty and unstable grate over the pit, collapses as soon as any significant weight is placed upon it. The remains of the dangling winch mechanism fall into the pit moments later. The athletics DC to climb the pit is 20. Creature Belcora's magic binds Kratonis to this level, preventing the Velstrak from leaving. After centuries surrounded by mindless aberrations and the twisted logic of the Sagathus, she has gone feral and lost all sense of purpose. She doesn't speak or respond to anyone who tries to communicate with her, but lashes out with a desire to inflict pain. She fights from the room's west end using rusty chains to strike her foes. If any hero obviously bears the silver-handled plus one ghost touch whip that once belonged to Volgrist, Kratonis recognizes it and appears are taken aback by its presence. She refuses to attack anyone carrying it, and anyone holding out the whip can compel her to cease her attacks, at least for a few minutes with a single interact action. However, Cratonus doesn't become any less violent or more prone to speaking. 
Crotonus is a female Evangelist Velstrak and a level 6 creature. In addition to her usual stat block, she also has the ability to inflict Velstrak Tetanus, a level 6 disease. Experience Award If the heroes get Crotonus to stand down by displaying Volgris' whip, award them 60 experience points as though they had defeated her in combat. If they later fight her anyway, they don't gain any experience points for doing so. Area E3 Monster Holding A Moderate 5 Encounter Three cells line the south wall, their bars only a few inches apart. Each cell contains a heap of rotted flesh and shattered bone. The locks on these cell doors have all seized shut due to age. Opening one requires a hero to succeed at a DC 20 athletics check to force it open, or a single DC 20 thievery check to disable the jammed mechanism. The center cell holds the only item of interest, a copper key that glimmers within the fleshy muck. This spare key can open the locked supply room in area E11. The creature in the cell consumed the key's last bearer decades ago, but couldn't digest the copper. Creatures In each cell, the fleshy detritus has coalesced into a strange creature called a Sharingol, a nearly mindless amalgamation of undeath and twitching life. These three Sharingol heaps remain motionless until one of them is disturbed, at which point they all slither forward to attack. The Sharingols don't need to open the cell doors to get out, as they can ooze between the bars with their undulating step. They pursue the heroes as best they can and fight until destroyed. Area E4 The Surgical Suite A Moderate 5 Encounter Lanterns hanging from the ceiling shine bright circles of light over three stone tables topped with metal slabs. A single lightweight chain dangles near each table. The remnants of a dead Morlock lies on one slab. Dried splatters of blood cover the walls, floors, and ceiling. The three lights in this room are magical. They illuminate the tables with bright light, but provide only dim light to the rest of the room. The metal slabs at the top of each table have hinges on the sides. A tug on the hanging pull chain causes the table's hinges slabs to fold down and then back up, dumping anything on the table into a 40-foot deep shaft into area F6. The slabs easily fold down from the underside, so anyone climbing up one of the shafts can open the slab and get out. The athletics DC to climb the pits is 20. Jafaki previously used this chamber for flesh warping trials, dumping failed experiments and waste from his surgeries into the pits for the oozers below to devour. He eventually deemed this location too inconvenient and virtually never uses it anymore. Creature The last time Jafaki came here, he abandoned a Morlock whose arms and legs he had amputated and disposed of. The creature died in agony, and its spirit arose as a spectre. The spectre wants only to inflict its interminable agony upon others, and still harbors a visceral fear of the operating tables. The bright light shining on the tables activate its sunlight powerlessness. Area E5 Medical Supplies Shelves of dusty bottles and surgical equipment line the walls of this room. Cobwebs and dust hint that this chamber has remained untouched for quite some time. At the center of the room stands a solitary pushcart. Jafaki kept spare parts, alchemical reagents, and tools organized in this room. He hasn't visited this room in decades, so many of the reagents have spoiled. On a successful DC-15 perception check, a hero searching this room locates an unusual key that fell behind one of the shelves. The key has a round shaft tipped with several teeth of varying length. It opens one of the locks in the plinth room of area F7. Treasure The shelves contain two sets of healer's tools, a set of expanded healer's tools, and alchemical reagents worth 10 gold pieces. Area E6, Hallway A steep staircase descends underneath a footbridge, which crosses this hallway at 20 feet above the ground. From this side, the double door to the south is barricaded with several bars of twisted scrap metal and a sturdy wooden shelf. 
The footbridge's wrought iron railing prevents anyone on it from easily falling off. With a successful DC-20 athletics check, a character can climb up onto or down from the footbridge. Area E7 Security Checkpoint Moderate 5 Encounter The heroes might have some difficulty reaching this area from the east, since a closed portcullis flanked by arrow slits blocks the hall, but a character can lift this portcullis with a successful DC-30 athletics check. Some of the bars near the north arrow slit have partially melted and twisted, perhaps caused by a powerful acid. A small or smaller creature who's trained in acrobatics can squeeze through the opening with a successful DC-18 acrobatics check, but the opening is too small for larger creatures. This central octagonal room is flanked on the north and south by single iron doors, each with a narrow viewing port and archery slit. The stone double door to the east features an emblazoned carving of a dripping skull, its mouth stuffed with weeds. The western double door is made of iron pitted with rust. This area acted as a gateway for Belcora's scouts to go out into the world, as well as an egress point for her army of well-trained champions. The double doors to the east lead to a passage that ends in a cave-in, behind the well-hidden secret door in the smuggler's refuge. The cave-in and the secret door are obvious from this side. Clearing the cave-in requires 40 hours of manual labour, but the heroes can divide up this task, with four characters clearing it in 10 hours, for example. The two guard chambers in area E7A and E7C, and archer stations areas E7B and E7D, were looted centuries ago, but still bear empty weapon racks. The east wall in area E7B has a lever that raises and lowers the portcullis. Although rusty, it still works and any creature squeezing past the gap in the portcullis can see the lever in the archer station. Area E7C has a secret door in its west wall that opens by manipulating a hook in the room's weapon rack. With a successful DC-20 perception check, a hero searching this room locates and identifies the door and how to open it. Creature, Belcora's chief assassin, Siora Fallowglade, tried to flee the Abomination Vaults during the chaos following Belcora's death. She murdered the two guards stationed here to hide the evidence of her flight, but one of the guards managed to inflict a mortal wound. Siora died before reaching the other end of the tunnel. At Belcora's death, a surge of negative energy swept through this area tethering Siora's soul to this area as a shadow. Siora is eager to create minions to serve her. She thus focuses on one enemy at a time. She steals their shadow, marks them for death, then murders them. She retreats if badly damaged, but only to set up an ambush later. An implacable foe, she continues her attacks until destroyed. Siora Fallowglade is a female greater shadow and a level 7 creature. Treasure. Two Bloodseeker beaks are stashed behind a dusty weapon rack in area E7D. Experience Award. Award the heroes 30 experience points if they reopen the passage to the smuggler's refuge, which they can use to more easily come and go from Atari. Area E8. Assassin's Quarters. The secret doors providing entrance to this room, one at the end of the hall that leads north, and another at the end of the hall leading south, are both obvious from this side. Dust and neglect cover this chamber's narrow bed, warped wooden wardrobe, and large footlocker. Siora Fallowglade once lived here, but no one has come here since her death centuries ago. The bedding and clothing have all decayed into threadbare scraps. Treasure. The footlocker contains a wide-brimmed red hat with a large black feather, which is a greater hat of disguise. A pouch of tiny emeralds worth a total of 25 gold pieces. And Siora's Poison Codex. This book contains the formulas for hunting spider venom, giant scorpion venom, giant wasp venom, and malleus root paste. The book is exceedingly fragile. The first time a creature opens it, 
they must succeed on a DC-20 thievery check or a random formula is destroyed as some pages disintegrate. On a critical failure, the entire book is destroyed. Consulting the book thereafter doesn't risk further disintegration unless the handler is intentionally careless. Area E9 The Elite Viewing Room A Moderate 5 Encounter the curved east and west walls contain tables with small built-in ovens, wood fragments, heavily dented pewter serving dishes, silver flatware, and crystal shrapnel litter the floor. A wide alcove to the south ends at a cloudy window overlooking a much larger space. An array of magical glyphs glow next to the window. This elegant meeting room is where Belcora's guests watch the arena matches and enjoyed food cooked in the kitchen below and kept warm in the ovens. Most of the debris scattered across the floor is worthless, but it creates difficult terrain across the entire room. The staircase leading down to the warped brew tavern in area F11 is choked with trash and is greater difficult terrain instead. The south wall overlooking the arena in area E26 isn't glass, but transparent stone. The glyphs on the wall control the magic infused in this stone. A hero investigating the glyphs who succeeds on a DC-20 arcana or occultism check understands how to use them. A creature manipulating the glyphs can make the wall ethereal. It still resembles transparent stone, but creatures and objects can pass through it, render it opaque, or change it back to transparent stone, as well as control what part of the arena it shows. Each change is a two-action interact activity with the manipulate trait. Creatures When Belcora died, two of her guests, squabbling aristocrat siblings, let their fear of being trapped in the abomination vaults overwhelm them. They murdered each other in the panicked rage and rose again as poltergeists who continue to fight until this day. Their hurled accusations against each other invariably escalate into hurled debris and these frequent rages have produced the wreckage throughout this room. The poltergeists put their differences aside to fight intruders, and they will fall back into their endless squabbling again if the heroes retreat. As they fight, they mutter phrases like, Can't get out! And, Trapped here forever! They fight until destroyed. Side quest. The heroes likely consider the poltergeists rambling as threats, but... They hold the key to putting the spirits permanently to rest. Anyone who responds to the poltergeist, even during combat, might get them to expand their worries with statements like, We have no way out of the arena! Or, There's no path to escape! If the heroes establish a clear exit path of open doors that lead to the surface, and describe this path to the poltergeists, the spirits immediately cease their attacks, concentrate on the avenue of escape the heroes describe, and vanish for good. Treasure Hidden among the debris is a dented lead-lined steel box. A character must succeed at a DC-20 thievery check to disable the jam mechanism that keeps it shut. No amount of force can get the box open. The poltergeists have been hurling it about for centuries already. It holds a Type 1 ring of wizardry with the symbol of Nimbaloth on it. Area E10, the Grand Concourse, a moderate five encounter. This stately hallway stretches from a single door to the north to a wide exit to the south. Frescoes depicting powerful creatures in battle with each other adorn the walls. Pinpoints of light glimmer in the vaulted ceiling, illuminating the hallways with a pale radiance. Balconies run the length of the hallway 20 feet above the door their low railings rusty and twisted in places. A stone bridge connects the balconies across the hallways to each other, providing access to the tunnels out of the hallways to the east and to the west from the balcony. Several badly damaged statues decorate the southern end of the hall. The vaulted ceiling reaches 20 feet over the balconies and 40 feet over the ground level. The pinpoints of light are irregularly spaced and at first appear to replicate the stars in a night sky. A hero trained in nature realizes that the lights are unlike the night sky from anywhere on the surface of Galarian, 
and instead represent what the night sky looks like on some incredibly distant world. Characters must succeed at a DC-20 athletics check to climb up onto or down from the footbridge. Most of the statues at the south end of the hall resemble exceptionally lifelike flesh-warped creatures, such as Grothluts, Driders, and Mulventox. All have been toppled, and most have been partially eaten. Two statues remain in reasonable condition, as described in restoring the statues further ahead. Creatures A mated pair of basilisks has a nest at the south end of this hall. The Sagathus occasionally send a flesh warp creature to clear them out, or a creature wandering through the area crosses their path. All have thus far fallen to the basilisk's petrifying gaze. When the heroes arrive, the basilisks lurk amid the statues of their victims. They viciously guard their territory, but don't pursue foes who flee. Restoring the statues All but two of the statues are too damaged to be restored, whether by basilisk blood or by other means. One appears to be a pale, vampire-like humanoid, known as an Urtafen, but the other looks like a far brawnier version of one. The larger creature is a Molventok, a type of flesh warp created from an Urdafan. It has lost its connection with its inherent purpose while petrified, and if restored, attacks in a frenzy until slain. If the hero is restored the Urdafan, he shouts, War Chieftain Kurdafel, Belcora has need of the eye! In Undercommon, screams in pain from internal injuries and dies. Treasure. The equipment here is too damaged to be useful, save for the Erdefen's plus one striking composite shortbow and the Molventox plus one Tamchal Chakram. The heroes can recover these weapons if they restore those statues. Experience Award. If the heroes restore the Molventox and defeat it, award them 80 experience for the combat encounter. Area E11. Locked Supply Room. Both doors leading into this room are locked. A hero without a key, Jafaki carries one. The other one is in the debris in area E3. Can force open each door with the successful DC-25 athletics check. Or pick the lock with four successful DC-25 thievery checks. This room's shelves are well stocked with jars of preserved organs. Crates filled with bones wrapped in rags, and surgical tools. Two armor stands flank the weapons rack to the south, but they bear only a pair of gnarled sticks in leather sheaths. Belcora's quartermaster once stored valuable supplies here, usually armor and weapons. All were removed in the chaos following Belcora's death, and this room sat empty for a long time. Jafaki recently discovered a key and decided to repurpose this room to store spare parts for his experiments, as well as magical equipment he doesn't need. He visits the room only every few months as needed. Treasure The shelves here contain a moderate bestial mutagen, a moderate juggernaut mutagen, a moderate quicksilver mutagen. The two wands hanging on the rack are a second level wand of summon animal and a second level Wand of Heal. Area E12, Sentencing Chamber, a moderate five encounter. The floor of this room contains several open square pits, one in each of the three alcoves to the north, and two larger pits in the middle of the room. A dais in the room's west end contains a stone throne with two rusty levers jutting from the floor next to it. In Belcora's day, Prisoners were brought to this room for the sorcerer to pronounce judgment against them. Nearly always, this judgment involved feeding them to the hydras below. The two levers correspond to the two pits. Each lever once released the supports on a false stone trap door, dropping anyone standing on it into the water 55 feet below in area F4. The hinges to the trap door broke away long ago and the fallen trap doors now rest at the bottom of the pool. The rusted levers are currently useless. The pits in the alcoves never had any trap doors. They simply drop into the water below, 
and were used to dispose of multiple creatures in quick succession. The pits are narrow enough so that a medium creature falling into any of them can grab an edge automatically. The athletics DC to climb these pits is 20. Creatures Jafaki trapped two Gibtas bounders in this room. His efforts to mutate or train them proved entirely ineffective, so he has given up on them for the time being. The Gibtas bounders attack intruders, but don't coordinate their tactics. They're smart enough to avoid the pits, and the Gibtas reduce to fewer than 40 hit points, start trying to shove opponents into the pits with its bouncing slam. Into the pits. A hero who falls into the pit and fails to grab an edge lands in area F4, awakening the Hydras there and potentially getting into a very tough fight. If the Gibtas fall into the pit, it briefly fights with the Hydra under the water, biting off a head and cauterizing the stump with its acidic saliva before the Hydra's other heads rip it to pieces. The heroes only see the roiling water followed by a clown of green blood and pieces of the Gibtus corpse floating to the surface. Treasure The stone throne contains a secret compartment at the back, a hero searching it who succeeds on a DC-18 perception check finds the compartment and its continents. A climbing bolt, a dragon turtle scale, and 31 gold pieces. Area E13, Gladiator Readiness Room. A low five encounter. Weapon racks stand at the northeast and southeast corners of this room. The southeast rack is empty, but the northeast rack holds a hatchet made of a dark crystal. Two alcoves between the racks on the eastern wall each have an open hatch and a ladder leading down. Additional exits lead out to the north, west and south. Gladiators ready themselves for aquatic battles in this room, climbing down the ladders to the shallows in the pool room. The exit to the north leads to the supply closet. The door fell off the hinges decades ago, and a mimic recently took the door's place. The weapon rack with the hatchet is another mimic. The hatchet is merely part of its camouflage. The hatches leading down into the water below, area F4, are open. Several of the ladder rungs are missing, so a character must succeed on a DC-10 athletics check to climb either ladder. Creatures A pair of mimics recently entered this room. One settled in the northeast corner, disguising itself as a weapon rack identical to the one in the southeast corner. The second mimic wedged itself into the northern door frame, disguising itself as the door that collapsed inward into the storage closet. If the heroes approach this area with great stealth, they might overhear the two mimics murmuring about the flavors of the dungeon's various denizens. Treasure Shattered jars fill the supply room in the north. Among the debris, the heroes can find a few intact bottles, including a lesser sea touch elixir and a corked glass bottle. A hero who succeeds on a DC-20 Arcana or Occultism check while investigating this room or handling the bottle recognizes the runes on its base, which is labeled as Bottled Air. Area E14 Lounge A counter wrapped around the northern and northeastern wall bears a few cracked serving dishes. A dusty and shattered display case features only grime and broken glass. This room once hosted gladiators looking to compete in the pits, where they fought to eventually become leaders of Belcora's army. A hero who searches the display case finds the words, They are watching you, carved into one of its wooden sides. Anyone examining this carving can attempt a DC-20 perception check. On a success, they realize that the words are near a hidden hinge, and the entire case swings aside as a secret door. Area E15, Waiting Room, mounds of white fungus blossom from what once was padded furniture in this small waiting room. Tiny fungal spores drift throughout this room. A hero who succeeds at a DC-22 nature check to recall knowledge realizes the dangers a spores pose and that limiting time in the room to less than a minute provides the safest way to prevent exposure. Hazard for each minute a creature spends in this room with any exposed skin, 
it must attempt a saving throw to avoid contracting fungal rot. Fungal rot is a level 6 disease. Treasure in the cushions of the sofa are 13 assorted silver pieces, minted centuries ago by a long shuttered mint that are worth 4 gold pieces each to a collector. Area E16, Administrator's Antechamber. This sitting room glows from the light of a fire, crackling pleasantly in a web choke fireplace at the east wall. A large divan has been pushed up against the door to the northwest. Several pittons pounded into the gap between the stone door and its frame, ensure it remains shut. The magic that sustains this fire has lasted centuries. Several harmless spiders inhabit the fireplace and have filled it with their webs over years because of the light that attracts insects. Removing the divan from the door is simple enough, but the heroes must spend 10 minutes with a crowbar or similar tool to pry the pittons out of the door to open it. The door's stone is magically enhanced and difficult to smash through, with a hardness of 18 and 76 hit points. Most attempts to bypass the door using magic fail due to magical protections placed upon the room beyond in Area E17. Area E17 Imprisoned Administrator A severe 5th level encounter this room's occupant placed magical defenses on the room to prevent teleportation effects or ethereal travel from accessing it. A glowing circle of runes covers the floor in this chamber. Parchment covered with cramped writing sits on a desk situated against the north wall, and the splintered remains of a bed are piled in a corner. In the chaos following Belcora's fall, someone locked the arena administrator, Chafkem in this room. As Chafkem previously warded his room against interdimensional travel, he was effectively imprisoned. Before he succumbed to starvation, the erudite wizard cobbled together reagents to mummify himself with parchment paper, hoping to one day escape his bounds and inflict revenge on Jafaki, who Chafkem believed ordered him to be imprisoned in this room. In his isolation, Chafkem has attempted to devise a means of escape by creating a temporary portal through the wall. A simple mistake in his assumptions rendered all of his calculations incorrect, and he has failed to get the spell to work, a point of great frustration for the vainglorious mummy. The magic circle at the center of the room assists Chafkem in maintaining magical energy. The circle gives him a plus two status bonus to skill checks when performing rituals. Additionally, he is quickened while within the circle, but can use the additional action only to sustain a spell. Creature. When the heroes unseal his chamber, Chafkem holds up his parchment-wrapped arms to show he means no harm. He's genuinely thankful for his release and quite charming by nature. Unfortunately, he's as bossy in undeath as he was in life and soon starts demanding rather than requesting information from the heroes about the current status of the Sagathus and the Abomination Bolts. If the heroes don't indulge Chafkem, he decides to kill them and animate them as undead, who don't talk back nearly as much. Chafkem is a male mummy ritualist and a level 8 creature. Side quest. As long as the heroes obey Chafkem's demands, and suffer his imperious demeanor, he can be a font of information. His initial attitude towards the heroes is indifferent, but they can improve it with a successful diplomacy check to make an impression, or another relevant skill, such as deception to lie, or arcana to recall knowledge that impresses him. The DC for this check is 27, which is the same as Chefkem's will DC. If the heroes get on Chefkem's good side, he speaks with open contempt about the Sagathus that Belcora permitted to operate their flesh warping laboratory on the next lower level, as they displace the arena functions Chafkem controlled. He doesn't know precisely how many Sagathus remain, but he describes their leader as an alchemist and a flesh warper named Jafaki, whom he blames for locking him in this room to die several centuries ago. Chafkem wants revenge against Jafaki, and he suggests that the heroes seek it on his behalf. 
Chafkum knows Belcora is long dead, although he expresses concern if the heroes let him know that she has returned as an undead creature. Chafkum makes plans to depart the Abomination Vaults and return to his native Assyrian. Whether the heroes want to let an evil mummy go free is up to them. Chafkum takes 2d4 days to put his papers in order and carefully replicate the arcane patterns of his magic circle before he leaves. If the heroes return in that time with proof that they've slain Jafaki or that the imp Zek orchestrated Chefkem's imprisonment, the mummy expresses his gratitude and rewards them with information. He sketches out the entirety of the arena level for them, including all its secret doors and passages, and provides the heroes with the magical passphrase to disable the trap in area E20. He doesn't have any blank parchment, so he writes on his spellbook page containing the freedom of movement spell. The heroes can later learn a spell from that page in addition to having the useful map. Treasure Chafkem's desk contains hundreds of pieces of parchment with writing covering every bit of space. For many years, Chafkem only had access to this parchment and he has made full use of it. These papers not only serve as Chapkin's spellbook, allowing heroes to learn a spell from them, but also contains the awakened portal and create undead rituals. Any hero who spends time investigating these papers discovers both rituals. Area E18, Level 5 Portal Chamber. The door to this room is locked, and Chafkem has the only key. A hero can force it open with a successful DC 25 athletics check or pick the lock with four successful DC-25 thievery checks. Swirling runes carved into the stone and filled with silver cover the walls of this circular chamber. The floor is polished smooth as is the ceiling ten feet above. The heroes might have discovered the inactive network of permanent teleportation circles Belcora installed to move quickly throughout the abomination vaults in the dungeon's upper levels. The heroes could have even started restoring the network if they discovered the Awakened Portal ritual. If they don't find this ritual in Area C-35, they can find it in Chefkem's notes in Area E-17. This room contains yet another inactive teleportation circle that the heroes can connect to others they've already reawakened. Experience Award Award the heroes 30 experience points for using the Awakened Portal Ritual to reactivate this room's magic. Area E19, Spying Chamber. This unadorned room is most notable feature is a secret door that leads to the Grand Concourse in Area E10. The secret door isn't obvious from this side, so a character must succeed on a DC-20 perception check to locate it. A hero who knows the series of knocks that opens the door on the Grand Concourse can also open the secret door from this side, making the door ghostly and incorporeal. A window of a one-way transparent stone allows anyone from within this room to view the events in the Grand Concourse. The stone appears opaque from the concourse side, and the window is undetectable. Anyone touching the transparent stone from this side can hear anything in the concourse through a permanent clairaudience effect. Area E20, Secret Hallway, a severe five encounter. Bones and dismembered limbs lay scattered throughout this irregular branching hallway. Belcora and Chefkem spied on gladiators from this secret hall, paranoid about insurrection. When neither Belcora nor Chefkem was present, they activated a deadly trap to protect the hall from intruders. The severed limbs once belonged to Sugathus, Skulks, and several flesh warp creatures who tried and failed to contend with the trap over the past several years. The jagged halls contain several blocks of one-way transparent stones, offering a view into the gladiator's quarters. The stone appears opaque from within the room and can't be detected Anyone touching a transparent stone from this side can hear the room through a permanent clairaudience effect. The two secret doors in this branching hall, leading to area E14 and E24, are obvious from this side. Hazard 
originally intended to keep intruders out of the secret hall. A scythe trap currently interferes with the Sagathus efforts to explore this area. The 15 foot by 25 foot area where the branching hallways connect contain dozens of pressurized plates that trigger the trap when someone moves anywhere in the area. None of the three narrow halls have any pressure plates. Though the blades pass through them, the trap lashes out with its blades, then retracts them and moves them around secretly so the blades next strike are hard to predict. The shuffling scythe blades trap is a level 8 hazard. Area E21 Staging Area Large, dark, discoloured patches of dried fluids adorn the floor of this oddly shaped chamber. A stone desk stands against the west wall and holds tools, bottles and a jar of variety of substances. Here, Belcora's agents kept notes about the gladiators they spied upon. Recently, Jafaki's minions have spent time and resources trying to disable the scythe trap in the hallway to the north and they stage their attempts here. Parchments marked with ticks indicate how the blades shuffle around the hallways when triggered. The Sagathas have sought a pattern in the randomness without any luck. The doorway to the southeast opens into a cramped and steep staircase, which leads down to the observation gallery in area F8. Treasure The heroes can find and expanded alchemist tools and three moderate tanglefoot bags on the table. Area E22, sludge-filled room, a moderate five encounter. Several feet of thick black sludge fills this room. The sludge is a creature, but that's not obvious upon a casual look, such as viewing the room through the one-ray stone in Area E20. Several weeks ago, Jafaki caught one of Uravain's devils poking around, lured them into this chamber, and sent in an alchemically modified black pudding. The ooze killed the devil and dissolved them completely. Creature. If disturbed, the black pudding rouses from its torpor to feed, pursuing prey relentlessly. The viscous black pudding is a level seven creature. Area E23, empty gladiators quarters. These chambers include nothing more than a single bed, an empty foot locker, and a metal chamber pot. Anything of value was stripped long ago, and each room has signs of being used as a prison. A metal bolt was once mounted to each interior for the sake of privacy, but some time ago, each of the bolts was relocated to the exterior to keep creatures trapped inside. This remounting has somewhat loosened the bolts. However, a character who succeeds on a DC-20 thievery check can open a bolted door from the inside. Area E24, Hall of Heroes. A giant mural wraps around this entire chamber. This mural depicts mutilated and flesh-warped warriors, grotesque and powerful, standing in a round room within a beam of eerie blue light. The blue light originates from a tall lighthouse, and the inhuman champions spring forth from the light to slaughter humans, elves, and other surface-dwelling creatures. The mural portrays how the arena's greatest warriors will be sent into battle by the Gauntlet's magic. The display was intended to spur the gladiators to fight more fervently, which could have earned them the right to battle on the surface in Belcora's name. The heroes likely remember this function of the Gauntlet from the artifact's recent test firing that awakened Atari's dead and sent a Scalathrax into the hero's midst in Chapter 2. Heroes searching this room discover a secret door in the west wall that leads to Area E20 with a successful DC-20 perception check. Poking two buttons in the eyes of the powerfully mutated ogre shown in the mural causes a section of the wall to slide upward into the ceiling. Area E25 Gladiator's Mead Hall a moderate five encounter. Overturned tables and benches, all made of petrified wood, lie scattered around the edges of this expansive chamber. Pale bones are interspersed with these furnishings. Several preserved monster heads and silver plaques adorn the walls, 
A glowing circle of runes is etched on the floor of the alcove to the east. Belcora's gladiators spent their leisure time in this room. The preserved monster heads displayed creatures killed for sport, including a basilisk, a chimera, and three manticores. The plaques commemorate victories in the arena. Many bear dates, all occurred within a 10 year period from 4235 AR to 4244 AR. The sturdy furniture, though upended, remains intact. The doors to the south lead to a very steep staircase descending to the testing grounds in area F9. Rarely did anyone descend these stairs, though losers from the fights below ascended them. The circle of runes marks a permanent active teleportation circle that connects the circle to the testing grounds directly beneath it. This teleportation circle functions both ways, but doesn't connect to the portal chamber network through the abomination vaults. A creature stepping into the teleportation circle appears in the training grounds amidst a blast of pale blue fire and a loud clanging noise. This fire is principally for dramatic effect and isn't bright or hot enough to cause damage. Anyone using the teleportation circle to travel to the testing grounds appears with a sigil on their forehead that reads, Challenger in Aklo. Anyone using the teleportation circle to return here receives a sigil that reads, Victor, instead. A new casting of sigil by the teleportation circle replaces any old one. Creature The scattered bones of gladiators slaughtered here shortly after Belcora's fall still hold on to the grim memory of death and combat. When a living creature approaches, they rattle and slide across the room, forming a massive gladiator made of the assorted bones of several humanoids. It tries to pursue foes that flee, but can't fit through any of the doors leading out of the room, which allows others to escape it fairly easily. It fights until destroyed. The Bone Gladiator is a variant skeletal hulk and a level 7 creature. Area E26 Arena Balcony This section represents only the top half of a massive arena. The arena floor in Area F26 holds the majority of the threat here. A wide walkway around this cavernous chamber looks out over a stone arena floor 30 feet below. Six balconies with built-in seating provide the best view. Each balcony has a bright torch jutting from it, illuminating the entire arena while leaving this viewing level shrouded in shadows. An enormous metal gong on the eastern end of the chamber hangs on thick chains. Two steep staircases lead down from the central balcony on the north side of the arena floor. Belcora and her guests watch the blood sports from sumptuous seating here, cheering on the gladiators as they faced off against each other or against terrifying monsters. The north central balcony has two large levers and crank wheels to control each of the portcullises at the bottom of the stairs that lead to the arena floor. Anyone exploring this balcony likely draws the attention of the two basilisks glaring nearby in the Grand Concourse, Area E10. The heroes can easily see the gargantuan Sharangol behemoth on the arena floor from here, unless they make an absurd amount of noise or attack the Sharangol, it remains dormant, probably for the best if the heroes are still only 5th level. A secret door on the eastern balcony is difficult to spot. A character who succeeds at a DC 25 perception check locates it, and they also determine the special series of knocks that turns the door ghostly and incorporeal, allowing the heroes to pass through. Treasure The six torches burning at the balconies are all ever-burning torches and take a minimal amount of effort to remove. 